He was a salmon farmer from Scotland whose charitable idea grew from helping a handful of kids in war-torn Bosnia to feeding over half a million children around the world. We'll hear his story tonight, so please stay with us. Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And even though our guest tonight is wearing stripes, he is from Argyle in Scotland. He's the founder of Mary's Meals. So please welcome Magnus McFarlane Barrow. Magnus, you, good, to be here. good to have you here. Thank you. We enjoy having folks from different parts of the world come to the show, and, and Scotland is, uh, we don't get too many guests from Scotland, so it's great to have you here. Great to be here. Now, tell us a little bit about what Mary's Meals is. Before we talk about its history, what is it? Mary's Meals is just a very, very simple idea. Um, it's about providing one daily meal for the world's poorest children. Uh, and we provide that meal in places of education so that we're not just meeting the immediate need of the hungry child by giving them food, um, but we're also at the same time drawing them into the classroom uh, where they can receive an education that can set them free from poverty. All right, now this is, uh, uh, there's a lot to talk about with this, but I'd like to know a little bit about how did you get started doing Mary's Meals? Mm -hmm. Well, um, maybe going back to, to when I was younger, when I was about 14 years old, um, my uh, family uh, visited Medjugorje in Bosnia. And after that, uh, my mother and father decided to turn the small guest house that I grew up in uh, into a house of prayer, a retreat center. Um, and since then, all the years since, we've simply opened the doors of, of what was our family home uh, and invited people who want to come and spend time in prayer and to take part in various led retreats uh, to do that. And then over the years, a little community of people who've um, decided to live there to support each other and living the gospel message uh, in a part of Scotland where there are very few Catholics. Uh, that little That's actually most of Scotland, isn't it? Yeah, most of Scotland. Uh, very few Catholics. I think there are about 15% uh, of the population in Scotland are, are Catholic. Uh, so that was that b background, there was that little uh, retreat centre and that's where I grew up. Uh, then uh, when I became a young man, my early 20s, I became a salmon farmer. Uh, I lived about one hour wait away. Minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you raise salmon? What do you do for raising salmon? I know how to raise corn. Mm -hmm. What do you do for raising salmon? Well, the kind of salmon farming I was involved in is out on the sea uh, in huge, big floating pens. Uh, you might have something like 10,000 salmon uh, growing in one uh, pen. Uh, and the work was fairly monotonous, to be honest, but I loved it, feeding the fish every day, uh, changing the nets, harvesting the fish when they're... So you'd have to inside. go out into the sea mm -hmm. and feed the fish on these large floating pens. That's right, yeah. Which was Did great. you have a... Now, when we have cattle in a pen, you have a mm -hmm. roundup. You don't do anything like that, do you? No, you no. have to do it all with the nets, pulling ropes in the nets to guide them into the right places, uh, which is an art in itself. Uh, it was all very manual in those days. It's become a bit more mechanized, that industry now. Um, but it was a great life. I enjoyed it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But now you're not raising salmon anymore. What are you doing? Well, uh, a huge part of, of, of my work now is just telling people about Mary's Meals, um, traveling to different parts of the world where people want to hear about it and where people want to get involved. And uh, another part of my time uh, is involved in visiting the projects where we're providing the meals in places like Africa. 
but most of the time I'm at home with my family. I have young family too. Okay, yeah, you've got six children and one on the way. That's right, Father. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Our, our next one's due in, in August. Uh, so this is my last trip away from home before that. Now, this is a big enterprise today, but how exactly, did, you, you mentioned something about go, having gone to Medjugorje and to Bosnia. Mm -hmm. What did that have to do with starting Mary's Meals? Well, years after that, in the early 90s, 1992, uh, my brother and I one evening had been watching a news item on the television in Scotland and it had been about the way people were suffering in Bosnia at that time and it concentrated on this particular refugee camp. And we both just felt moved to try and do something small to help the, the people there. And uh, actually, if I'm honest, it was over a pint of beer in our local pub, we began talking about maybe we could just do a, a, a little appeal, just ask people to give us food and clothing and blankets to take to those people. And almost before we had thought it through properly, this little appeal had begun and people began giving us gifts of these things. And uh, about three weeks after that conversation in the pub, uh, we found ourselves driving this truck uh, across Europe um, into a refugee camp near Medjugorje uh, and delivering this aid that people had given us uh, to the people uh, there. And I always say I think that was the first miracle in the story. I think it was the first time my brother and I ever hatched a plan over a pint of beer that actually happened. So that was, <laughs> that was amazing enough. But I, I came back home from that thinking um, that I'd done my good deed and that it would be back to work as normal on the, on the salmon farm. But God had a completely different plan um, because by the time I got home, all these things that we'd asked for, uh, all the food and clothing and so on, continued to pour into into our family home. People just kept on you, you giving. You put all this in the house? It was, uh, we put it all in a little shed in the garden that uh, my father had. I asked him if I could borrow it and uh, this shed was bulging full of these things by the time I got home and that, that presented me with a, with a dilemma. And so how did you resolve this dilemma of all the stuff to give away? Yeah, well, what did you do? I, I, I thought about it and prayed about it for, for not for long, actually, because I think I knew pretty quickly what I was meant to do. And, and uh, I, I gave up my job and uh, I sold the house that I lived in then. Uh, and somebody gave me a small truck and I simply began driving that back and forth from Scotland to Bosnia during the war, taking aid to the, to the refugee camps. Were you ever in danger when you were bringing this in? Not, not really. I was normally doing it the easy way and taking a lot of local advice about where to go, where was safe, and most of the people in need had fled to the safer areas. Okay. S sometimes we were going into the cities that were under siege, like Mostar and near Sarajevo and so on, um, and, that, and that was frightening. But again, we would always depend very uh, much on local advice about when to go in and when was safe and so on. Okay, so, mm. so you weren't, uh, you had no interest in you know, the, the military maneuvers. You were just simply trying to bring food to refugees from the war who were hungry. Exactly, as, as simple as that, just very, very simple. And, and just uh, through doing that at the beginning, I began to, to learn how these very small uh, little acts of kindness, how, how much they could mean for people uh, there who had lost everything, people who right. had nothing. Right, right. Now, the war, in Bosnia has ended. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I take it you're not driving back and forth to Bosnia? No, uh, we, we no longer work in Bosnia. We do a little bit. We support one uh, orphanage in Bosnia still, but most of our work has moved to other parts of the world now. So what is Mary's Meals doing at this stage then? If, if you're not going to Bosnia, what are you doing uh, with Mary's Meals today? Well, the, the, the campaign of Mary's Meals itself, the thing I described about providing a daily meal in school, it, it was born 10 years after that first delivery of aid uh, in Bosnia. Uh, and it was born in, in Malawi, in, in Southeast Africa. And uh, I first went to that country in 2002. And, and uh, so people understand Malawi is a mm -hmm. very poor nation. Very poor. The, the, uh, at this stage, statistics show it's the sixth poorest nation uh, on, on earth. Many, many people there are facing a daily struggle to, to survive. Many children dying of, of malnutrition there. Yeah. Many children out of yeah. school uh, because of poverty. Yeah. Uh, but 2002 was a particularly bad year. It was a famine year across the whole of southern Africa. 
uh, and our first work in Malawi was a very simple uh, emergency response. We were simply um, buying food uh, in the cities with donations that people had given us and we were taking that food into villages where people were literally eating the leaves of trees and the roots of trees to, to survive. And during the course of that, of that work, of that very simple project, I met this family um, in one of the villages uh, and through meeting them, um, that was one of the big inspirations for starting Mary's Meals. And it was a, a local priest, a local parish priest, who took me to visit this family. Uh, and they lived in a small mud hut in the village. And the priest explained to me before we entered their home that the, the father of the family had died, he'd had AIDS, and that the mother was now dying also. Um, and he said he thought she probably only had two or three weeks to live. And, and when I entered their, their home, um, Emma uh, was lying on her bare mud floor and she was in a lot, of, a lot of pain. And she was surrounded by her six children. And I began talking to her and she said something to me like, you know, there's, there's nothing left for me now except to pray that somebody's going to look after my children when I'm gone. And she was really panicking about that because all of the adults in that village that she knew were already caring for orphans because of the AIDS epidemic. And then after that, I began talking to her, her oldest child sitting beside her, and, and he was called Edward, and Edward was about 14 years old. And I said something to him at one point, maybe like you'd say to any young person when you're talking to them for the first time, I said, Ed Edward, what are your hopes in life? What are your ambitions? And he said to me, I'd like to have enough food to eat and I'd like to be able to go to school one day. And, and that was the extent of, of his ambition at, at 14 years old. And that was something we encountered over and over again doing this work that the very poorest children in the world aren't going to school because they're just simply trying to survive. They're begging exactly. or whatever exactly. it might be. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things that we don't appreciate is how difficult survival is and that how a lot of these children have to develop their own quick wits to figure yeah. out ways to get food for themselves and their families because uh, their parents sometimes are dead yeah. uh, you know and they're, they're not living in orphanages yes you know? exactly exactly uh, especially yeah. if the parents die of aids mm -hmm. then some people are afraid of the children lest they are carriers which they're not yes but people fear that and so yeah. there's a stigma on them as well. There's that as well. And ma many children I know uh, in Africa, nine, 10 years old, who are now head of the household, looking after younger siblings and, and just doing whatever it takes to, to survive. Exactly. So yeah. the idea of going to school mm -hmm. is a far away dream. Yes. You it's know. A, uh, exactly. It is a dream. It's, it's a strong aspiration. It's something they desire. They know that that can be their escape from poverty. But, but food is obviously even more important on a day-to-day -day basis, so that right. comes first. And that's why linking the two things can be so powerful in terms of breaking that, that cycle. Well, how do you make the link? Well, what, what we do is, f first of all, it's very important to us to work through the, the local communities and villages like that one in, in Malawi. This work is not about us from the outside charging in and thinking we're the ones that are going to solve all the problems. So first of all, when, when um, a community comes to us and says, could we have Mary's Meals in our school? The first thing is that we do is we sit down and we talk about that with the local community, with the chiefs, with the head teachers. And we say to them, look, we'll only do this if you really believe in this and you really want to take responsibility for the day-to-day -day work and specifically we invite them to volunteer their time uh, to do the cooking and the serving of the food and only when that's established will we go forward and at that point we then build a small kitchen uh, that acts as a storeroom as well um, and we begin buying the food in bulk and we begin delivering it to that community but when the food's there it's then the community that does the the daily work of volunteering to to make it all happen so so your volunteers mm -hmm. do not go to Malawi to start cooking meals and things like that. No, but very rarely on the odd occasion, we'll um, ask someone with particular skills to go to one of the projects if there's a skills gap where we're working. But absolutely, m most of the time, it's about local volunteers doing that work. Yeah, and that's, that's one sense of respecting their dignity as well, that they yeah. have skills. 
Ab absolutely, absolutely. And, and, uh, and first and foremost, th these are their children in that community and they have a huge desire, even more than us, to see those children fed, to see those children going to school. They believe in it passionately. Uh, Mary's Meals is something that they, that they love with all their hearts and that they're very, very proud uh, to be a part of. And without them, this work wouldn't be happening. A lot of these places are still tribal in structure mm -hmm. and village oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, uh, does that present special problems or special helps or a combination of both? Well, sometimes it can, it can cause some, some problems. Actually, I would say more often it's a huge uh, advantage, the sense of community and identity that's very, very strong in those villages. So probably much more than in, in the West, people feel a sense of shared responsibility for the children in their community. So it's a very natural thing there for people to um, club together, to volunteer, to do something for the community. Uh, that, that's something that, that's um, easy to ask people to do there. I think it would be much harder um, to do a project like that here in, in the West. It's something that really I find striking. In Malawi, for example, there are nearly one million orphans in that country because of the AIDS epidemic. One million AIDS orphans? Yes, and yet in, in Malawi today, there's hardly a single orphanage. Nearly all those orphans are absorbed by the local community, are looked after by you know, aunts, uncles, grandparents, the community at large. Um, and the idea of a child being abandoned, especially in the rural areas of Africa, is, is very, very rare. It's something that very rarely happens. Yeah, uh, it, it, and it depends on the place. Uh, right, yeah. A priest friend of mine, Father Terry Charlton, mm -hmm. is working in Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, started, he started an orphanage for AIDS orphans yes. because, again, people didn't want Mm -hmm. these kids around they were afraid they yes. carried AIDS yeah. and so he started an orphanage where not only did they feed them mm -hmm. they give them dormitory and they school them so it's in uh, that mm -hmm. situation which is much more urban yes. you know it's yes. a much more urban situation then they need orphanages yes. but that's not the case in the, the villages. Not in the rural areas. And, and, and Malawi, as the example, is 90% of the people live on the land, growing their own food, very rural. Absolutely, I uh, agree with you in terms of the urban areas. It can be very different when we're working uh, in the cities in Kenya or in Haiti, for example, in Port-au-Prince, uh, in those slums uh, where that sense of community is very often broken down. Uh, it is a much more of a challenge uh, to find volunteers to do, to do the work. That's something oh, very, very noticeable. But uh, I'm going back to your question about um, can the, 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 the tribal uh, divides cause a problem sometimes with our work? It can, but sometimes we've been really surprised how Mary's Meals has helped even in those situations. So for example, in Kenya, we're working in an area uh, where two years ago, there was quite a lot of tribal uh, conflict, a lot of violence, um, and we've begun Mary's Meals in that area. And one of the things that the community uh, there is now telling us is that Mary's Meals is drawing children into school from different tribal groups uh, and that they are actually now learning together in school for the for the first time so that's a beautiful thing for us to hear do they uh, in, in that particular area do they speak the same language in that area they do very often they don't which would make right. that difficult but right. in that area they do and in many of those countries like kenya a lot of the education system is in english um, as well so that would be the the common language would be english yes. Uh, as well as the local languages. That's right. So yeah. the children would typically become bilingual at least. Yes, that, that, and in many countries in Africa that's, that's true. Not always English, some of them are obviously French speaking as well, but there's very often that common language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. These ed the education process is um, you know, very important, and yeah. Mary's Meals is making the education possible. What Tell us a little bit about what it is that you feed them. Well, we're always as much as possible committed to buying food locally from the local farmer. So that we, that we want as much as possible to support the local economy, to support the local farmer to grow more. So we'll very often say to farmers that, that we'll buy whatever they can grow for Mary's Meals at a particular price and that allows them to have the confidence to grow more food. 
Um, so, th so then, uh, accordingly, we, we, we um, provide school meals according to local taste and custom and so on. So That's very important. Yeah. Ab That's very important. Uh, absolutely. Abso I, absolutely. I was working in Peru uh -huh. some years ago, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things to help nutrition, you know, the, the staple of the diet is the potato, mm -hmm. which comes from Peru. Yeah. And people love their potatoes. They have lots and lots of varieties of potatoes. Yeah. But to give them a little more vitamins, they started to introduce carrots. Yeah. People didn't like carrots, so they wouldn't yeah. eat them. And it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So you have to be sensitive to local tastes as well. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And I see that often, sadly, sometimes uh, well-meaning well but misguided initiatives are about bringing food in from the outside. And it very rarely works because people have very set tastes generally. So, for example, in, in Malawi, most people there uh, grow and eat maize, white maize, uh, and we serve a porridge Which is what dish. We, we Americans call corn. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Kind so of white corn, maize. Kind of corn. That, yes, exactly. Uh, and so, so we, we serve what we call a corn soya blend. So it's that uh, corn maize mixed with soya, uh, some sugar and some added vitamins. It's a very, very nutritious uh, meal for growing children. And by the uh, way, vitamins in American English is vitamins. Vitamins. <laughs> I'm getting a good language lesson here too. Uh, well, I, I'm just <laughs> consider me a translator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> so added vitamins as well, and uh, it makes a great, great meal for the children, for growing children. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Oh, that's good. What does it cost per child in a place like Malawi? In Malawi, it costs us at the moment $10, a little less than $10 to feed a child for an entire school year. For a year? Yeah. $10 a year? Yeah. And yet That's today, remarkable. I know, I know. And, and it's one of the reasons why I think um, the fact that children are still starving to death in this world is insane, in this world of plenty, when we can feed a child uh, for that kind of, of, of money. Other countries we work in, different costs, but a global average at the moment would be about $15 to feed a child for a year. $15. So this yeah. is, uh, you know, something that has a long-term impact, yeah. not only on the life of the child and nutrition, mm -hmm. but again, you link this to the education process. Yes, and, and that's why we believe it must be one of the most cost-effective ways of, of helping children who are hungry, but also one of the most cost-effective ways of, of genuinely helping to lift those communities uh, out, out of long-term poverty. One of the other things that I know you do is called the Backpack Project. Mm -hmm. What is that? Again, it's a simple idea. Uh, we noticed when we began Mary's Meals that many children were coming to school for the first time, and that was wonderful. But we also noticed that many of those children didn't have anything to begin learning with. They didn't have a pencil or a bit of paper even to begin. So we started a little appeal back home in Scotland, first of all, just going into schools there and asking children if they would like to fill uh, a school bag, a backpack with basic educational items. And we made a little list. Uh, can you put a pencil, a jotter, uh, a you know, notepad, a tennis ball, um, just some basic things to help the child begin to, to learn at school. And we found that, that children um, who we are asking this of absolutely loved this idea. It's, it's a beautiful way to, to show children that they personally can do something real uh, to help and that they can reach out directly to a child uh, in Africa or Haiti or wherever it might be. And, uh, and teachers love it too because it becomes a, a great way of teaching children about, about those issues in, in the countries where we're sending the backpacks. So I think we've sent nearly 200,000 backpacks uh, overseas at this stage uh, oh, that's great. Uh, to some of the children who are receiving Mary's meals. That's, see, that's, in one, a lot of ways, that's better than children giving money. When I was a little yeah. boy, we would uh, have little boxes mm -hmm. and we'd put our change in yeah. there yeah. And, and send it for the missions. Yes. But it was just, you know, a few dollars, you mm -hmm. know, maybe a couple dollars a, a, of change. Yeah. And it went off into some general fund and you didn't sense. But this is where the actual backpack, you don't have kids send you money. They yeah. actually pack 
yes. the, 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 the backpack for them. Sure, exactly, and it becomes very, very personal, uh, and it's something that, that they never forget doing, I, I don't think. And, and very often we notice that uh, children who fill the backpacks write a little note uh, telling the child who's going to receive the backpack about themselves and about their family and they might say that uh, we'll pray for you and so it, it really creates this beautiful um, per, you know personal gift rather than something more anonymous exactly. and indirect. Exactly, yeah. exactly and that and it makes a big impact on the children who are recipients of these backpacks. Yes, exactly. Do they get the backpack itself? They do, they get the whole thing. And, and it, it's one of, I, I always feel it's one of the biggest privileges I've had in my, in my life, and I've had many, to, to, to watch children receiving these backpacks. Because these children that, that receive these things are children that will never have received any kind of gifts at Christmas or on birthdays or anything like that, to, to suddenly receive this thing in that one little bag. There's more gifts than they ever would have received in, in their life. And it's hard to describe the, the joy uh, in those villages when they open those things. And also just that sense of amazement that somebody on the other side of the world that they don't even know would, would do that for them, that would think of them yeah. and, and do that. Yeah, you know, that's, I, I think that that's a, a very important element as well, is it makes a link from one part of the world to another yeah. that uh, people don't even know what they look like, you know, and, yeah. and they'd be surprised at some of the the, the kinds of folks that they are yeah. being helped by. That's right, exactly, exactly. So it really makes those links strong, and that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. In one sense, it almost seems as if uh, you're involving the children in the West with the life of the village. You're yes. making them villagers too by sharing in the care of the village. I, I think that's true, and we hear these ter that term these days about us being a, a global village, and I, I think in many ways that's true, and I think in many ways that's a lovely way to think of us as a human family. Uh, and I, I think so any, any ways that we can find to make those, those um, linkages possible and, and, uh, and, yeah, and make it people t to really express their love for one, one another, even though that they might be great distances apart or might come from very different uh, cultures. I think when we can find ways to do that and break down some of those barriers, uh, I think we do a, a, do a great thing. You know, it was Marshall McLuhan that mm -hmm. came up with the phrase global village mm -hmm. uh, way back in the 1960s. Okay. And he was talking about it in terms of the media, you know, making events mm -hmm. around the world come into your home. Mm -hmm. So just like in a village, everybody talks about, you know, the local news. Mm -hmm. Well, now we talk about, the, you know, in our homes, mm -hmm. we'll talk about the news yeah. from the Middle East or from Africa or Europe or mm -hmm. Asia and, and, and all over these places yeah. and they're back and it's back and forth. Mm -hmm. But this brings another level of human communication mm -hmm. that's not just mass media. It's a personal gift yes. that, that, that I think makes a more intimate link. And, 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 and for us that's really, really important in terms of our, our work because we, we always at the heart of it want to, to make this a work of love. You know, when I, when I um, think about Mary's Meals, I always think about it as, as just a series of lots and lots of little acts of love from, from the people who are perhaps donating the $10 through to the women in Malawi who get up at first light to light these big fires to start cooking that, that uh, corn soya porridge that we serve. Um, just lots and lots of little things. No one's doing anything spectacular. But, but everyone's united just in that very simple aim of providing that hungry child with, with a meal. And that, that's something beautiful. And I, I think there can sometimes be a real danger uh, in being involved in this kind of work where it can, it can wrongly become very divided in our thinking, where we think perhaps that we um, in the richer countries are the givers and the people in Africa are just passive receivers, yes, yeah. and, and that's not what this is about at all. Uh, it's about people walking together and giving what they can in their circumstances, sharing what God's given them, whether that's material goods uh, or, um, or time or skills. And hands. And hands, yeah. 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 We need to take a little break, yeah. but we're going to come back in a couple of minutes. We want to get some questions and uh, learn more about Mary's meal. So please stay with us.
Thank you and welcome back. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, give you some information about Mary's Meals. If you would like to go to their website, it's very simple. It's www.marysmeals.org. M-A-R-Y-S-M-E-A-L-S. Marysmeals.org. Mary's Meals is one word. And you can find out more about their project. Uh, get more. I guess you have a lot of pictures on the website. We do. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of lot of pictures because they're doing a lot of cool things. You know. Uh, you know for you to see, and know what they're up to. So go to that website and check it out. Uh, also, if you are able to come and join us on pilgrimage, we strongly urge you to do so. We love having you come and be part of our studio audience. Uh, you can contact our pilgrimage department by calling 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or you can go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they will help you with a number of things. First of all, where you can stay. They'll, they'll, they'll give you suggestions locally. There are a number of hotels in the area. Um, also, uh, they'll give you information about scheduling for the masses, the television programs, tours of the network, and they'll give you maps of how to get to Hansville to visit the sisters and go to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. There are a number of things going on, and we'd love to have it. They'll even give you directions to some of my favorite restaurants. We have restaurants here that are also religiously themed. We have Hamburger Heaven. <laughs> now, the cows are the ones that are in heaven. It's, 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 but that's another problem. And we have a Golden Rule Barbecue. Yeah. I mean, see, it's very, very <laughs> religious. Yeah, very religious. Yeah. So we, uh, we'd love to have you come and join us. Um, are you ready for some questions? I am. All right, let's start off with a lady here from, uh, from where? Where are you from, ma'am? Uh, Sydney, Australia. Sydney, Australia. You win the Long Distance Award. That's a good long trip. I, I think you were in my audience when I was speaking there last year. We were there at Harris Park. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's great to see you on this side of the ocean. It's wonderful so to welcome. see you too, Father. And what is your question? I was just wondering if uh, the wonderful work you're doing has landed Australia. Do people there know about what you do? And is there a way of um, taking it down to them? Because that is a place of, uh, as they say, a land of plenty. So I'm sure they could give back to you to give to the poor. So what's your links in Australia? There are, there are a number of uh, people supporting our work in Australia, uh, and they're just at the stage where they want to organize something uh, more formal uh, there to register us as a non-profit organization and so on uh, within Australia. Uh, and some of them actually are in Sydney. Um, so uh, anyone in Australia who would like to get involved would be great. Uh, we can put them in touch with other people already. If involved. they went to your website, www.marysmeals.org, would that be a way for people in Australia to know more about Mary's Meals. Exactly, that would be the right thing to do. And then if they want more information or to us to put us in touch with others in Australia, they can just drop us an email and we'd love to do that. Okay, so there, so there are ways mm -hmm. to make those links. Because you know this program plays in Australia mm -hmm. and this would be a, a way for people there to know more about it. Yeah. And in their sphere of influence, there are mm -hmm. some very poor areas Mm -hmm. You know, where the because uh, it's, it's not only Africa that has the poverty. You're in, in other continents besides Africa. We are. We're, we're in Asia. We work in the Philippines and in India and Burma, Thailand. Uh, we're also in Haiti in the Caribbean. Uh, we do a little bit with street children in Eastern Europe and Ukraine and Romania. Uh, so we're in many parts of the world. Yeah, that, yeah. that's really great. Mm -hmm. About how many children worldwide do you feed? We're currently feeding uh, 526 th uh, million children, uh, sorry, 526,000, just over half a million children uh, a million every children. day around the world. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's an incredible thing. When we first began with those 200 children in Malawi, we never, never thought for a minute that we would end up feeding over half a million children every day. 
but at the same time, I should say, we still, in every country where we work, we have a waiting list of schools um, waiting today for Mary's Meals. So uh, we're certainly not thinking the job's done. We really want to go on and reach more hungry children. Okay. All right. So there's much more to do. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's have another question here from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Florida, the good U, uh, USA. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but thank you for what you're doing, and I want to welcome you to our country. Thank you. And I have several questions. Um, I'd like to know uh, where you get your funding. Mm -hmm. And I know that part of your mission is not finding school teachers, but since you work in the school system, I'm a retired school teacher and I would love to, to volunteer. So it, could you speak on that issue? And uh, one last question, how do you do all this with six children and one on the way? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take uh, these Thank questions you. one at a time. First of all, where do you get your funding? The vast majority of our, our funding uh, comes from many, many small donations from many people. It's very much the, the widow's might, the small donation. Uh, and, and when we think that $10 can feed a child for a year, those small donations do, do a huge amount. Right. Sometimes we're also lucky enough to receive bigger donations or support from corporates and, and, or trusts and things like that. But the vast majority of our income uh, is, is a small donation for, from the many. And, and we love that. That's the way we want to remain. You know, this is the way that this network works as well, mm -hmm. that it's, you know, so many small donations from a wide variety of, of people mm -hmm. that make this network possible. And this gives us a very important link mm -hmm. to the people that we're, 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 we're yes. working with, yes. uh, that, that people are very generous mm -hmm. with what they have. Yes. And that's really a great thing. And, I'm, and you experience the same reality. Absolutely. No, that's very, very important. Uh, very important to us. And, and I think the next question was about volunteering. And that, that's part of that same uh, idea that, that, that virtually all our work around the world is done by unpaid volunteers, both on, on the cooking the meals side, but also on the, the fundraising side. We, we, we're not an organization that pays for any advertising. We don't pay teams of professional fundraisers. So the work grows primarily through people volunteering their time um, to raise awareness, to organize little events, or just simply to tell their friends, or to become trained speakers. We have an army of trained speakers around the world who go into their local schools or their churches and um, talk about Mary's Meals. And, and that's how this beautiful thing is, is growing. Now, this lady, as a retired teacher, mm -hmm. sounded like she was interested in volunteering to be a teacher mm -hmm. in one of the schools. Do you do any of that kind of arrangement? Be very rarely, uh, because uh, most of all, we work with local volunteers uh, in the countries where we're providing uh, the meals. So only on very rare occasions is the, there an opportunity for someone uh, to go over as a volunteer. But there are, there are some, some occasions uh, where, we, where that's possible and needed. You know, and if somebody wanted to be that kind of volunteer, they mm -hmm. could also go to the website, www.marysmeals.org. Yes, exactly. For, for both sides, exactly. For either side of it, lots of opportunities to get involved in volunteering in their own country uh, and, and, and much less opportunities, but some to, to go overseas and work in those countries. Yeah. Now, the third question, mm -hmm. how do you manage this as the father of six children with one on the way? It's a great question and, and I think the simple answer is that I have a very amazing wife uh, and, and I met my wife uh, while I was driving trucks of aid into Bosnia at the very beginning. Uh, she was a nurse who had given up her uh, work to help the people in Bosnia also. Uh, actually she embarrassed me greatly in the early years when, we, when the work started growing and we had to buy uh, bigger trucks to take all the aid that was coming in. We got to a stage where we had to go and sit our uh, licenses to drive the huge, big, articulated trucks. And uh, Julie passed her test first time and I failed. Um, so <laughs> she, she likes to remind me about that now and again. But she's a wonderful wife and she, she uh, believes in this work as much as I do. So she's incredibly uh, supportive um, when I have to travel. Most of the time I'm at home. First of all, I'm a husband and a, and a father and that's my first uh, vocation. Yeah, and that's, uh, well, how old is your oldest? He's 13. Th and the youngest? Uh, well, we have a, a new one on the way in, in August, uh, and we have a three-year-old. 
three-year-old. So, yeah. so you've got them spaced out over a number of years. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, do they help out with Mary's Meals? They love it. They, they know all about it. And some of them are interested in different aspects of it. The boys love geography, so they always want to know where I am in the world and look it up on the map. And uh, so they're, they're all interested in different parts of it. They love it, yeah. Okay, that's great, mm -hmm. that's great. I oh, have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Gulf Breeze, Florida. Good to have you here. And what's your question? Well, our parish has a mission in Chimbote, Peru, and I recommend everybody to go to their parish mission anywhere in the world and, and experience that and see the poverty. It's so overwhelming, and uh, I just felt like I couldn't make a difference. You know, it just is always going to be there. So. I had chosen to just become a madrina to three godchildren, you know, and I send them to school and get a good Catholic education, and I'm hoping that they can help their people, you know, when they grow up sure. and turn it around. Sure. But it is a, a great need, great, great need. So yeah, you need to yeah do good. that's which is another way that people help out the very poor is yeah. by their parishes mm -hmm. adopting a mission in another yeah. place and making a link between a parish in the West yes. with one in, in a poor country. And, and we, we do something very similar to, to that. Uh, we call it sponsor a school scheme. And, and through that, uh, we allow a parish or a school or any kind of group uh, to support a particular school with Mary's Meals. Um, and, and when they do that, we, we put the name of the group that's supporting the name of the parish or the school uh, on the side of the kitchen wall that we build for Mary's Meals. And we send back photographs and regular uh, information about what's happening in the school. So a similar idea, and it creates a real link. And sometimes people from those parishes visit the, the school and, and so on. So again, it forms those real links and forms relationships between, between people. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that's um, one of the aspects of the church. You know, the church is not only a local reality, it's mm -hmm. an international, global reality. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that's very important for people to understand is how global the church is yeah. and that this means you we can actually especially in this global village that Marshall McLuhan talked about hmm. we can actually forge relationships between the various parts of the church yes and, and and that's one of the wonderful things about us living in in this age where, where we are in many respects a global uh, village in terms of the communications that are available uh, to us and all those possibilities that, that weren't there uh, in in other ages we, we we now have and we can really use them for 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 the good in terms of us really creating that human family in, in a different different way now as you have described the process of doing this. It sounds like you went from one success to another. Have there been any tests of your faith along the way as Mary's Meals has developed? Well, I mean, first of all, I would say I, I, never, I never planned any of this. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, so, some of these things look like uh, good ideas, and in one respect they are, but I wouldn't claim uh, responsibility for any of those ideas. Things have just happened and, and evolved. Um, I suppose in terms of challenges, I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to do this work. I don't have any experience before this of uh, working in large organizations. Um, so yeah, you, it, well, yeah. I don't know. A salmon school sounds pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of salmon, but not, not a very big business. Uh, so that, that's been a real, uh, I suppose, sometimes a test of, of faith, because sometimes you can start to doubt, can I, can I really do this as it gets bigger? Am I really capable of, of doing this? And, uh, and God continually, though, over the years, has just sent uh, the help that's needed at the right time, especially in the form of sending people with particular gifts and skills um, who, who, who help with the work of Mary's Meals. And, and, uh, and that, that's something that's really taught me a lot. But it, it can really, uh, I have found at times that really tests me uh, and, and, and pushes me to trust in God more uh, because I know it would be a, a disaster very quickly if I thought this was about me or any of us involved in Mary's Meals, thought this all depended on us. Yeah, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's oftentimes the case when mm -hmm. God is taking us 
beyond our abilities, yeah. then we feel like, uh, it reminds me of some of the cartoons where Bugs Bunny runs off a cliff and he's walking along in thin air and that's sometimes how we feel like we're yeah. walking in the air yeah. and it's going to take God to keep us from falling. Absolutely, absolutely. But it's good. It's good. It's good to uh, to be able to grow like that as well. To, to learn sometimes how uh, how small and, and weak we are and our, and our limitations. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a good thing. Where uh, you, you mentioned that there are requests for Mary's meals to come into more schools, mm -hmm. and you keep on doing this with the schools. Where are some of these new schools? Where, where, where are some of the places that are looking for help? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, in the countries where we're already present. So again, in Malawi, uh, Liberia would be one of our projects. And there's a massive need there in Liberia at, at the moment. They, they've gone uh, through a terrible civil war. Absolutely. And there's peace yeah. now, but you know, this is... Yes, they're at a stage where they're starting to rebuild their, their country after that terrible war. Uh, a, a generation of children missed out in school there because of the war. Many of the children that we are now feeding in schools in Liberia uh, were former child soldiers, uh, children right. who were forced uh, by the armed groups to take up arms during the war. I don't think we appreciate how yeah. bad these child soldiers were. I mean, they were given drugs yeah. as little children yeah. and a gun and told to go out and, and they had you know their, their conscience was yeah. destroyed Absolutely. by the drugs and by the orders to go and shoot other people that's right very often they were forced to kill their own relatives their own families so th those children have suffered so much um, so there's a real, real sense in, in uh, Liberia of people trying to uh, to rebuild uh, and th those children in, in many ways trying to regain a childhood that was lost. Um, so sometimes you have older teenagers now in Liberia going to school for the first time and trying to, 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 to make up for lost time. Sure. Sure. Uh, sure. So also in, in Haiti is another place where, yeah. where we, there's a desperate need and we're just starting to go into more schools uh, there. Uh, we work with an amazing uh, American priest, Father Tom Hagen, in, in the slums of City Soleil, and uh, he built these amazing schools there. Um, and uh, they all were destroyed uh, during the earthquake, and we've just helped to rebuild those. Um, and we're serving meals in those schools again now. But now we very much want to go into more schools on our waiting lists in, in Haiti. I know I, I recently got a letter from a, a Jesuit from Haiti whose school was destroyed and they're trying mm -hmm. to rebuild. And mm -hmm. this is the situation throughout Haiti yeah. that, you know, the, uh, the, the schools were, you know, a, a source of trying to bring life up and yeah. they got knocked down in the earthquake. Yes. And rebuilding that and feeding the children is a very difficult situation. But, but it's crucial. These schools in, in uh, City Soleil is a huge slum of half a million people living on what was a rubbish dump, no sanitation, no running water. Um, just, I think it's the worst poverty I've, I've ever seen in, in that place in, in Haiti. And these schools- Worse than Malawi. Worse than Malawi. In terms of that urban squalor and, and that, just, that um, sometimes just a sense of people being stripped of their dignity in those situations amongst that, that squalor and that real breakdown of um, community and people don't have the same sense of identity, I would say, uh, that people in Africa very often have very strongly that they know who they are and they know where they belong. I think very often in the urban slums that's, that's lost and there's huge problems with violence and drugs in, in those slums in, in Haiti. And those, and those schools that, that, that this Father Tom uh, Hagen built there were these incredible symbols of hope. I mean, because of the, the violence there, they, from the outside, they look like big prisons. They have high concrete walls with barbed wire around the fence of them, um, around the, and there's shooting all the time outside. But within these walls, he's created this little oasis of peace. And th these, these schools were these incredible symbols of, of hope to the community there. People knew that through their children attending those schools, there was, there was this hope of them escaping um, that, that poverty and that life. And one of the beautiful things about Mary's Meals at this stage, after a few years, is to be able to go and meet some of the young people who are now I was just going to say, it's, it's, it sounds like over the years, mm -hmm. you've developed some personal relationships with a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, a lot. And, and again, I think that's important because we never want to lose that. Sometimes when I hear um, aid organisations talking, it's all about implementing projects and strategies. And sometimes I think within that, it's easy to forget that it's about people and, and about relationships. And um, yeah, I, I've got to know many people that we work with over the years. And um, just an example of that recently, I was back in Haiti and um, I met a young man, he was head boy in one of those schools that I just described, uh, and he's called Jimmy, and uh, very talented young man, very, very clever, uh, good musician, uh, speaks perfect English, just passed all his exams at the end of school, and I spent a whole day with him and um, just talking about his life and about what he hoped to do, and he told me how he's now going to go on and study agriculture um, at college, and his one desire was to help the people of Haiti to get better at growing their own food. And, and, I, and I looked at Jimmy and I just thought, you know, um, it's people like Jimmy and, and his friends, that generation Haiti, that are going to, to solve the problems of that country and lift um, their people out of poverty, uh, not us. And, and that's really um, what we believe in Mary's Meals, that, that, that we are helping with one small important part, um, but it's not us that's eventually going to, to solve these uh, problems. And again, Jimmy that day really struck me. I spent all day with him in the school and at the end of the day, um, I took him back home. And he hadn't mentioned about his own home circumstances and he lived in the very worst, um, most violent part of that slum of City Soleil. And the little house that they did have had collapsed during the earthquake and he was sleeping under a bit of uh, makeshift uh, canvas uh, with his family. And all the time he talked to me, he just talked to me about how grateful he was for Mary's meals, how grateful he was to God for the opportunity to go to school. He knew that's what would be, uh, that would, what would change his life. And he never thought to mention about his own dire uh, circumstances and what he'd suffered. Yeah, you know, this, is, uh, this is one of the things that you, you meet people mm -hmm. who have, uh, you look at them, and I'll, I'll never forget a woman I met in mm -hmm. Peru mm -hmm. who said, you know, Father, we had a fantastic month. We made $30 this month. Mm -hmm. We were so happy we gave half of it to the poor. Now, yeah. the rest of yeah. us are looking, you know, if you made $30 a month, mm -hmm. we would consider that poor. Yes. But they look upon this as, no, we're rich. It's yeah. the poor people who don't have $30 a month. Yes. And, you know, this is something that you, you just it's become beautiful. very impressed with such people. It can be very humbling, can't it? Very humbling. Yes. Also in terms of, of faith, so often I find that people who have um, nothing, at least nothing materially, are so often people of great faith and great trust in, in God. I remember quite a few years ago now I was in uh, Colombia uh, and I was with an English priest there who was working with street children and I used to go out with him early in the morning at first light out onto the streets um, and he had a day centre for these street children and we were helping him build a, a new children's home and he would go out at first light and find the children and offer them hot breakfast and begin to get to know them and find out why they were on the streets and so on. And this particular morning uh, we were out and I had a journalist with me from Scotland who wanted to write about the plight of these street children. And we found a little boy sleeping under some cardboard. And I, I would say he would have been about six years old. And we woke him up to, to give him breakfast. And uh, the journalist with me at one point said to him, um, who, who, she was trying to build up a story of his life. And she said, who, who's, who's your best friend? And uh, he looked up and he said, God is my best friend. And uh, I was quite taken aback and so was the journalist because we knew that little boy had never been to school. He'd certainly never benefited from any catechism. He didn't have parents who had taught him that. He was on his own on, on the street. And so she said to him, you know, why, why do you say that? Why, why do you say God is your best friend? And he said, because God gives me everything I need. And this was a little boy who didn't know where his next meal was coming from, who'd seen his friends murdered on, on the streets. And, uh, and that's very often been the case for me, that sometimes you think that you're the one going into these situations to do the giving, and, and yet you receive so much more back exactly. sometimes. That little boy definitely evangelized me that day. Exactly. No, that's e exactly yeah. the case. You know, mm -hmm. like that lady evangelized me yeah. in the uh, marketplace of uh, Lima. Mm -hmm. um, I want, again, I want to let you know that you can go to Mary's Meals, www 
marysmeals.org and find out more about this and how you can help and how you might even be able to volunteer. Magnus, thank you very much for joining thank us. You, Father. And I want to give you all my blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And just like Mary's Meals depends on small donations that go a long way, all of your donations to EWTN to our, from our family keep us going. We depend on all the, the, the gifts that you give us. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay our bills and keep bringing you great guests like Magnus and all the other folks who bring us programs. God bless you for your generosity, and thank you for making this evangelization possible. Thank you.